it's just an HDMI cable. I think it's coming again. I have hope. Maybe I just killed it. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. I like dealing with the worst thing ever. It's a nice uh, lead-in. The hardest thing ever. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, the the issue with um, it, what made me do this was in various roles I've had, usually as as a manager, but also as a designer and architect, I've had to work on daytime libraries, right and I've always find out that unless you're very obsessed with this, people make mistakes, they make compromises that they shouldn't make. So the, most systems re require uh, a daytime data type. Few languages include a generally, a generally applicable one. Right? There, are, there, there are some, and in fact, the one in Julia is, is pretty good. Uh, as a result, developers often design and implement one or more special types. Uh, when I was at Goldman, we had about four of them. Uh, the design and implementation is time consuming, right? People think it's going to be easy when they start. A year later, they still think it's going to, not going to be too hard, and five years later, they've given up. Uh, the, it's, it's error prone. You make mistakes. The mistakes are hard to catch, hard to, hard to correct. And, but interestingly, integers and floats, right? Every, la every language has integers and floats. People use them seldom. I wouldn't say never, but seldom do people feel the need to, to roll their own. So what, this is sort of the third time I've been doing something like this, and I said, okay, let me see if I can design one and implement it that will actually solve the problem for every use I could conceive of. Right? So uh, overcome all the, all the limitations while having a very good performance and making appropriate space-time trade-offs. I implemented it in pure C, which was painful. I mean, not even C++. I did it in pure C to make it so that it could be integrated into other languages easily. And the first one I chose to, tr to do was, was Julia, which I think was a very good choice. I developed both 32 and 64-bit versions of it, so they have the same precision, uh, same accuracy, but uh, they can run on different, different processors, and it's a simple switch. Uh, the requirements, the first trade-off people make is, is range versus uh, precision. So I figured I might as well cover a reasonable range. So I went from the Big Bang to the year 100 billion. So if, if anybody needs something beyond that, we can discuss it, but it would actually make a significant change. As far as useful precision is concerned, a lot of people need to work at the nanosecond level. In finance, people are starting to think about picoseconds. I figured, why not go to attoseconds, right? So attosecond is a billionth of a nanosecond. And it's the only, it's, right now, it's the, the smallest useful increment of time. In physics, it's used, and I said right there, it's about the time it takes light to cross a, a nucleus of an atom. So that's about the smallest thing that people are able to, able to measure. Uh, I include specifiable precision and uncertainty. My engineering background 
always ir irks me when people leave out the precision and uncertainty notions in, when they're trying to do computations. So I integrated that in with the date time. I include a comprehensive set of operators. Now it's not just the standard six. I end up with 20 operators because when you look at precision and uncertainty, you're now comparing ranges as opposed to comparing uh, individual values. Uh, I've defined there are different types for relative and absolute date times, which is important. It properly handles leap seconds, which some people claim to do. I haven't found an implementation that does it great so far, but uh, this, one, this one actually does it. Uh, handle atomic time proleptically. I mean, proleptically means uh, extending it back into, into history, which includes the early atomic period. The, the true atomic period started in 1970. There was a period in 1960 where atomic time was handled in a slightly different way, so I've integrated that. I do the Julian to Gregorian conversion for calendars, which occurred at the various times from 1582 to 1923, depending on the, on the country. Handle all the time zones in the INA database, IANA, which those are the ones that are publicly available. There are 356 of those, and each one has history to them, right? So it's not just the time zone as of today, it's a time zone as of going back into the uh, 1800s. Uh, universal standard and wall time are important to be supported. A lot of formatting, uh, specialized features. I use uh, some of the ones in Julia for defining new binary operation and the uh, extensive documentation and test cases. You can never have enough. The architecture of the system is like, it works like this. Uh, the, on the low level is uh, just counting ticks. So you see that that's a 36-digit number you see there. That's, that represents uh, where we are now, 1972, the start of the atomic era, is those 35 digits worth of, 36 digits worth of ticks there. Uh, right now, the time right now is represented over there. Uh, UTC time, which is sort of the refined replacement for GMT, and then local time layered on top of that. Uh, there are a number of C implementation details. It's a 128-bit type. Uh, the, um, I'll, I'll, I'll skip this because I want to be able to get to the, to the demo. In the Julie implementation, the UC call essentially works beautifully. The extended uni Unicode binary operators are quite useful for these uh, range comparisons. Uh, use default arguments to simplify constructions. Nullable types are also quite useful. And, and you, you can see here the uh, implemented in point six. Use 0.7 was very, very useful to upgrade to, to try to get to 1.0, and then this version is in 1.0. Okay, as far as demonstration is concerned, I'll try to do that as quickly as I can. I made a self-running demo so that you wouldn't have to watch me type. But what, what this does is it uses the eval function within Julia to be able to so I have a code segment that I have a description for, and I execute that code segment and, and display it. These are all the, the tests for the uh, libraries. So uh, there, uh, part of this exercise, and I defined an uncertain float type, right? uncertain float 64, and this will show you how that range works. You see I use some of the formatting to do the plus or minus, so I have the, uh, the value with the precision, plus or minus uh, another value. Uh, larger values have a different maximum precision, as you would expect. Here's one with a defined precision and uncertainty. I'll go through these quickly. There are quite a few of them. The precision and uncertainty are, are maintained through all the arithmetic operations, right? Which is which is important because you see you see the one the subtraction. You now get you get two plus or minus three. Uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm not sure if I can do that in a command prompt window. Maybe if we could turn off the lights here. Is that readable now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Good. Sorry about that. So, again, I, I, I'm, I know my times. I want to go through this, this quickly, show the actual date stuff. So, here's the, you know, the propagation of the uncertain, the precisions and the uncertainties. Zero values are really uh, difficult for, for propagation of uh, precision and uncertainty, right? And I, I, that's all handled correctly. Uh, now, I, I use some of the bar graph capabilities in the Unicode plotting package to show the 20 operators. So you see the your standard ones, and then you see ones with primes attached to them with the English meaning of them there, the English description. And you see the, those are, so it's 5 plus or minus 2, 10 plus or minus 2 have no overlap. So that's how the 20 functions would operate. And for various ones, they operate differently. Here's some of the UTC the date times, the formatting of the date time, right, uh, for the, the entire range of it. Function subtracting date times gives you relative date times, and also precision and uncertainty will propagate. I'll show you something, uh, some of the stuff about the Julian or Gorian calendar conversions. Leap seconds are handled properly here. See, the time June 20, June 30th, 2015, there was a leap second. So you see, it's 59:59, then 59:60 and then uh, zero, zero. So that's how leap seconds get handled. The time between them is two seconds. My time is up, so I'll leave it here. Okay. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jay. <laughs> is, there a, is there a package for this? I, 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 it's, on Git, it's on GitHub right now, but I haven't, I haven't put it out there for a general release yet. Okay. Well. I, I'll be really happy when you do, because this is, I'm, as I say, I'm so happy that other people do this. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah,